I joke that there's this other guy inside me that is very good at observing the way that I go about doing things in the world. Like it's almost your default setting is you can't control it. You know, there's a lot of things that I didn't realize were triggers for me until my mid thirties. So just in the last five years. And that word trigger is thrown around a lot. You know, people are like, oh, he put mayonnaise on my sandwich and I was triggered. Dude, no, that is not a trigger. What is up everybody? Welcome to the show. Today I spoke with a professor at James Madison University. She studies interpersonal communication, attachment style, parent-child communication, romantic relationships, among a ton of other stuff that we got into in the episode. It was a super awesome podcast. Expect to learn about the importance of attachment style, as well as some strategies on how to have a better romantic relationship with your partner. We overall just had a great conversation about society, community, culture in general. Hope you guys enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Welcome to the show. Thank you for taking part in this immersive listening experience. A meaningful existence is a moving target that no matter how close, will always be out of reach. We hope this message finds you with an outstretched hand. As we attempt to uncover complex truths, remember, life's toughest questions can be answered if we all just focus on one thing. Being good people. Um, let's just start with um, a brief overview of who you are, what it is you do, what is your background, things like that. Okay. So my name is Dr. Jenny Rozier. I am a associate professor of communication studies at James Madison University. I have been here for 13 years and I specialize in teaching and speaking and writing and researching about communication skills that will would be helpful in parent-child relationships and romantic relationships. I often have a emphasis on interpersonal neurobiology and how attachment um, impacts us throughout the lifespan and impacts how we communicate. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I, I find, personally find myself a little bit more interested in like the romantic relationship side of things. Um, I actually had you for that class. I don't know. You probably don't remember. It was a Zoom class because it was online. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why you were one of the first people I thought of because uh-huh. I think I'm just used to seeing you like virtually. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, she's going to be great on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you? What would you consider yourself? I know you kind of have this – there's this broad thing of attachment, parent-child romantic relationships. Is there one thing that you would maybe say you um, specialize in more or is it kind of a broad understanding of all of those things individually? Yeah. So I have a broadly, I'm just interested in how we can make those two kinds of relationships work better. So romantic relationships and parent child relationships. And I'm willing to go down any avenue to answer the, that que- that broad question on how we can just improve those relationships. Um, and also broadly, I'm interested, I'm fascinated by how the way that people communicate with us change the architect, changes the architecture of our brains and then causes us to communicate in different ways. Right. And so broadly, I am interested in that whole like de- human development and improving those two specific relationships um, in any way, specifically through communication. More directly, more specifically, I focused, I don't know, in the last few years, I focused a lot of research on studying the cry it out sleep training method, which um, parents often use with their infants to help them sleep through the night. Um, I also have been starting to research how our childhood stories are um, like the stories we tell about our childhood to others um, are really uh, consumed by our attachment needs being met or unmet. And so like a lot of the stories that you tell your friends, like, oh, I had the best childhood story or I had the worst childhood story that you tell people. Um, we usually consider them the best or the worst because an attachment need was being met or an attachment need was being unmet. And so I'm very interested in that. Um, 
And I used to do a lot of research on disrespect. I tend to do like five projects on a topic and then move to the next one. (laughs) So I used to be really interested in disrespectful communication and why we put up with it in romantic relationships, how much we're willing to put up with, um, what disrespectful communication does to our relationships um, and different kinds of disrespectful communication. So I've really been all over the place. I recently started a line of research where I'm trying to like get a deep understanding about Gen Z dating trends because I'm fascinated by them. Um, some of the things that Gen Zers are doing are is new and confusing. And um, it also f- appears that lots of Gen Zers are not happy about it. And I, so why are we doing it? You know, why, why are they continuing to do these dating practices that are so widely um, expected and agreed upon um, when they don't like them? Uh, and then I'm also interested in how attachment is, I think, playing a role in why those dating trends are being chosen. Cool. Well, I will say I'm not the person to talk to about this because I was never very good in the dating world and I haven't really been in it. So... But Sorry. you you know what happens. I mean, just yeah, online yeah, yeah. dating in general is so it's so new and it's so foreign to previous generations. Yeah, I talk to my girlfriend all the time. Like, I'm so glad we met in school because I have no idea what I would do right now. Same. I don't know how I would navigate that. Like, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know how I would navigate figuring that out. Like, how do you pick someone to go on a date with just by looking at a picture? I don't know. So there's lots of new things that I think are changing the way that we date. And that's important because the way that we date impacts how our population continues or doesn't continue. And um, so there's some real life consequences to changing the way that we have those like early dating practices. Cool. I think um, something that I see is just a curiosity that you have about human beings that I also feel like I have for various things. Like I always say, I wish I had a bunch of part-time jobs because I'm fascinated by so many different things. I agree. I, that's how I feel all the time. Like I will, I have a very broad interest, but my specific interests sometimes don't seem to connect to people. (laughs) They're like, wait, why are you studying this? And then this, um, and I would argue that they are all interconnected and that is why I'm capable of studying. You can't study parent child relationships and not study romantic and you can't study romantic relationships even more heavily without talking about our childhoods. So they're all interweaved with each other. Yeah. And I think you've probably done reflection on this, just studying attachment and, you Mm -hmm. know, the things that happened to us when we were young. Have you given any pointed thought to where that curiosity comes from? Have you always had it? Is it something that you've been able to be like, oh yeah, that's when it started? Yeah. So when, so I had, I had some traumatic childhood experiences myself and, um, So I had like a really magical childhood growing up. My parents were married and happy and everything was great. And then when I was 12 years old, uh, my father got a terminal illness diagnosis and um, he was sick on his deathbed, off his deathbed, on his deathbed, off his deathbed for 12 years after that. So the first 12 years of my life were normal. The second 12 years of my life were horrendous. Um, And what's interesting is that when I was growing up, like I never questioned if I was good enough. I never questioned if I was loved, if I was lovable, if I was good at doing things. I had a really high self-confidence. It was really hard to shake. Um, And then my dad got sick and I had this really traumatic life experience. And most people, or at least my understanding of the world pre going to college was well someone who experiences something this traumatic and when i was 24 my dad died so 
you know, he was sick for 12 years and it was crazy, but then he passed away when I was 24 in grad school. And so most people would look at this and be like, well, you must be like really messed up. Right. <laughs> I think a lot of people think that, um, people who experience this, these negative life experiences have a lot of um, issues. And, and I always wondered why I didn't, I always felt really confident. I felt really sure of myself. I felt, I always felt like I was enough. I felt like people liked me. I felt good about being in relationships. I was never scared of intimacy. I was never scared of self-disclosure. I didn't have any fears. And I just was like, how did I come out of that? Okay. Now, am I perfect? No, I've got a ton of shit that, you know, I have trouble with daily. You know, I've got control issues and I've got, uh, I've got issues with people telling me what to do and I can't handle it. It triggers me. So I'm not perfect, but I'm not, you know, messed up the, the way I thought most people would be who experienced that. And so when I was in grad school, so I guess I was always interested in this whole, like, how am I making it through? What's going on that's helping me get through this tough time? Um, and then when I was in grad school, I learned about attachment and it just answered so many of my questions. And it made me realize that it's not about the traumatic event that causes these negative things to happen to you. It is about how your body reacts during that negative life event. And if you have a support system to help you get through that negative life event, you can get through it. Not unscathed, you're different, you're changed, you're affected, but you can get through it and feel relatively okay um, if you have people walking you through. And, and I did. I had, I had my mom, who was a secure attachment figure to me. I had my dad, who was a secure attachment figure to me. I had a grandmother, uh, family friends who were in my life daily, um, aunts and uncles. You know, I had lots of adults that were helping me get through that time in my life. And so I was affected. I am affected by it, but I have come out the other end with a little bit more resilience. Um, and so I think I just was always fascinated by that. And then when I was an undergrad, so even before my dad had passed, before I had learned about attachment, I had a teacher who studied interpersonal communication. And I, did, I remember sitting in her class and just thinking she was really cool. And I thought, how people like do this for a job? what do you mean? Like people study relationships? And she was like, um, yes, <laughs> it is a huge area of research. And I just thought, well, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to figure out how to be good at this thing that I know is really important and that essentially makes the world go round. And I mean, I, I truly believe that relationships are really the only important thing, um, in our lives. So, yeah. Awesome. And I think, um, I think there was a couple things there that I had a question about. Let's see if I can navigate them. The, the first one was, um, do you think that that, I guess, um, for you personally, when you were talking to that awesome professor, you're like, you can study this. Was that also at a time where you were realizing things about yourself? Like, oh, maybe you were making observations or you were pondering that sort of thing that happened to you when you were growing up sure. of it was almost like two sides to the same or like the opposite of you had this perfect childhood and then or near perfect or you know yeah it whatever. was magical yeah and then it was a kind of like a hard stop flip oh, change yeah. and then you were like oh that's why like i see how i've turned into this person who has these interests yeah. now yeah i mean i think i didn't know i'm a first generation college student and so i didn't know what uh, graduate school was when I was an undergrad. Uh, I was planning on opening a nail salon when I was in college. <laughs> that was my life goal was to like get a business degree and then go open a nail salon. I could have done that out of high school. I don't know why I felt like I had to go to college for it, but that was my plan. And then, like I said, I got in that one class and um, the teacher just inspired me. Uh, she had us teach the the class about something that the class didn't know about. And so we did this survey where we like 
put all these topics like who knows about what. And then we picked something that the class didn't know that was on the list and we taught the class. And I just rem- it was the first time I had given a speech for more than four to six minutes. It was like 30 minutes. And I stood up there and I taught the class about this theory and they actually listened and they were interested in what I had to say. And I started like bringing in stories from my life to explain the theory. And I've always been a storyteller. And so that seemed really natural to me. And so I started bringing these stories in and I was like telling them about my life and how that relates to the theory. And they all like asked questions and participated in discussion. And afterwards she stopped me after class and she was like, have you ever thought of being a professor? And I said, no, (laughs) what? I don't even know. What do you mean? And she's like, well, I know you like this stuff because you're really interested in this topic, but have you ever thought about teaching? And I said, well, I thought about teaching like elementary school, but you know, there's no money in that. I don't want to do that. And I watched my mom, you know, struggle doing that my whole life. I don't want to do that. And she said, well, I was like, I'm going to open a nail salon. <laughs> she goes, she goes, well, you know, I think you should think about going to grad school and being a professor. And I didn't know what any of that was. And she sat me down and she showed me how to change my major to communication studies, which I did. And then she talked to me about grad schools and helped me fill out applications. And the rest is history. And I just got obsessed with it. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I just thought it was so cool that you could study the human experience and I could spend my whole life learning about something that I really liked. Because I think I just, I've always liked the learning part. (laughs) The learning part's always been cool for me. And so it was just like, I could do that forever. That sounds awesome. (laughs) Yeah, I have like a similar story where it was almost like, it's weird how the things that people tell you you're good at, you're just like, okay, yeah, I like this now because you're giving me compliments. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I was taking a Reese or a, what the higher level uh, public speaking class. Oh yeah. Yeah. And at the time, so I'm a fitness coach now at the time I was really starting to get into it. And so I did all of my presentations on like a movement and a workout or things that were related to fitness. And I just remember, I can't even remember who my professor was for that class, but they were pretty much just like, I can tell you're going to be speaking to people for your whole life. And that was the thing I loved the most about communications was that the whole time it was like, it doesn't matter what you talk about. What we're talking about is how to communicate those ideas clearly. Exactly. It doesn't matter what the topic is. It's like, this is how you do it. And, and, and it only takes that one person who is good at what they do. Right. So if that teacher that you had wasn't good at, speaking in front of people, you'd be like, you wouldn't have taken it as seriously, you know, (laughs) but probably because they were good at their job. And then they're telling you that you're good at speaking in front of people as well. Um, I mean, it means so much more and it only takes one person like to give you that, that boost to make you want to do it. I mean, I joke with her all the time that I owe her my career. I'm still friends with her. And I joke with her all the time. Like I literally owe her my career. Um, She retired recently and from a university in St. Louis or something. And uh, I went to her online Zoom retirement party and everyone was going around the little Zoom thing, giving a story about her. And I just said that, you know, she had no idea how much she meant to me. I was just a poor kid from PG County, Maryland, who was barely finishing college so she could open a Ah. nail salon (laughs) and (laughs) have my nails done for the rest of my life. And she saw something in me that I did not see in myself, not professor, get a master's and a PhD and be smart. What? And use big words. What? Like I didn't, I didn't think about that at all. And then write. And I mean, I'm a writer now. Like I write books and I, I write, I never would have thought that I would have done it. And I even write in my free time. It's relaxing to me. It's a creative outlet to me. I enjoy writing. People ask me, what do you do on the weekends? And I like, I wake up in the morning and I write for an hour because I love it. I don't have a writing deadline. I'm just writing a book forever, (laughs) you know? So I, it doesn't take many people to, to inspire you. 
And I yeah. thank her all the time. And I, I kind of want to come back to something that you said that I really, it struck a chord with me where you said you've always felt confident, comfortable, liked, secure. Yeah. Yeah. And I felt the same, even though I was going through stuff that in my head, I was like, I know this is challenging. Yeah. And um, I, one of the stories that I tell myself and others is that I dealt with like minor bullying growing up. And I say that, and it was all, it wasn't intentional. It was the way that I was perceiving the way people were interacting with me. And a yeah. lot of it was due to me isolating myself. So sure. there's definitely a big ownership thing that I now have realized mm -hmm. that at the time I didn't, but even through all that, I still felt like my parents loved me. My family loved me. I had friends that I really enjoyed being around and it's a compliment that I've even gotten from people. Like you can deal with adversity pretty well. Yeah. That's that resilience. <laughs> Is that something that comes very early on with that attachment? Because it sounds like you are almost living proof of that where sure. like you had this very wonderful upbringing and then even when things turned to being the opposite of that, you still were okay with handling it to some degree or maybe more capable. Exactly. And yeah, that's what attachment research would show is that a strong attachment foundation can be developed in the first three years of life. And that foundation can stick with you the rest of your life. You can build on top of that foundation. Attachment is malleable. It can change. You can get more secure attachment. You can get less secure attachment. Um, but the main things that really impact attachment in negative and positive ways is when you go through, like throughout your life, when you go through a negative life experience, do you have someone going through that experience with you? Are they helping you get through that experience, especially when you're a child? Are, are you doing it by yourself or are you, is an adult, a secure attachment figure adult helping you work through those feelings, helping you work through those um, things that you're thinking about? Are they actively helping you get through it, right? So um, if you have a secure attachment foundation and then you have a negative life experience like your parents getting divorced, um, most would call that a negative life experience. But you know people, everybody listening knows people whose parents were divorced and they are fine quote unquote, fine, right? They are, they seem okay. And then you also know people whose parents are divorced and they are a puddle of a mess on the floor and they cannot hold a relationship. They are either scared of relationships because they never work out or because they're not worth it, or they are um, obsessed with being in a relationship because they're trying to fulfill this void that they have inside of them. What happened with that first group of people? Well, somebody who was with them, either mom or dad or grandma, some secure attachment figure was able to help them get through it. They, they didn't have to deal with their emotions alone. Now, does this mean that the people who are not okay, their parents were like, screw you, deal with it by yourself, or they were abusive or neglectful? No, that's not what it means either. But you have to understand what the negative life experience is doing to the adults as well, especially if the adults don't have a secure attachment or resilience. Um, it's very hard for a mom who, or a dad who has divorced from their partner to put their feelings kind of on the back burner and deal with the feelings of, of a child when they themselves are so devastated, when they themselves don't have the coping skills to cope with it. And so it's not, I mean, are there times where kids are told like, deal with it yourself, like get over it? Sure. Sure. There are. And that's wrong. And we shouldn't do that. Where does that stop? Like, where do you, like as a person who is insecure and sucks at all that, and they have a child and they recognize that I don't want to be to this person, how my dad or mom or figurehead was to me. How do you start that process? It is very, very hard to break the cycle, but anybody can. Anybody can. No matter what tools you have, anybody can break the cycle. And so 
I think that the very first step is to learn everything that you can um, about attachment. Take an online attachment course, listen to a podcast, pick up a book, um, and read a lot about attachment. Do a significant amount of self-reflection. Um, work through your own stuff. I like to tell my students that uh, they should become a student of themselves. Become a student of yourself. Study yourself. Reflect on your own behaviors. Reflect on your own past. Think about your own triggers. Make plans. Journal. Write things down that you want to stop doing and that you don't want to do with your own kids that maybe were was done with you. Write down things that your parents did that you do want to do with your own kids. Breaking the cycle is not easy. It is very difficult. Um, I like to tell my students that we're all born and we are given a toolbox by our parents. Every single one of us is given a toolbox. Some people have like a really nice, shiny snap on toolbox that, you know, one of those like $10,000 toolboxes and it's gorgeous. And there's like locking drawers and there's multiple drawers. There's, um, there's things that you can hang stuff on the side and it's just really beautiful and shiny and new. And some people are given a rusty lunch pail style toolbox uh, and you don't get to choose the toolbox that you get. You don't get to choose it, um, but it's given to you. And throughout your life, tools are put in those toolboxes and they are the tools that your parents used with you that likely came from their toolbox that their parents gave them. Some of these tools work really well. They uh, work really well at getting whatever behavior the parents want, whether it's obedience or quiet or, um, you know, calm. Uh, they, the tools work, work really well, but they sometimes also have like side effects, right? So they're really simple tools. You know, a hammer is a very simple tool, but a hammer can only, you know, really works if you're just hitting the nail. If you hit the wood next to it or you hit the wall next to it, it also puts a hole or a dent in the, in the um, wall or the wood. And so while they're very easy to use, they don't require a manual. Um, they're not always the best tool to use. Then there's also like really fancy tools that you probably learned uh, by taking an online course or by going to college or uh, some amazing you know, per communication guru taught you this awesome tool. The problem with this tool is that it's usually harder to use. It takes a lot more energy. Sometimes there's a really thick manual that comes with it. You got to read the manual. You got to practice using the tool all the time. And so in the heat of the moment, when you've got to deal with something, we often reach for the easy tool. Maybe it's not the most effective, but it's the easiest. And it, we don't take the time to use the difficult to use, but better tool. Sometimes your parents use tools with you that you hated, like you hated it. Your parents maybe used shame or blame or criticism and you hated it and you swear you are never going to use that tool with your own children. But the tool is still in your box, it's still there. Whether you want it there or not, you might hate it. You might curse it. You say, I'll never do that. I will never shame my children. I will never blame them. I'll never criticize them. I'm not going to do it but it's there. The goal is to put it in one of the drawers that locks and like put it in the back, put it in the drawer that locks, lock it up and try your hardest not to use it. But unfortunately, human development has this interesting thing about it where when we get older and life gets more stressful and life gets more difficult, sometimes if the tool is there, it doesn't matter if it's locked, it doesn't matter if you hated it, it doesn't matter if it hurt you. When, when we need a tool, we often take the tool and use it. And we use that tool that we hated so much. And so I think one of the things that you can do as an adult is you can assess the tools in your toolbox. And when you are with someone that you want to create a life partnership with, you tell them those tools are there. Like you're going to work really hard to not use 
the bad tools and you're going to work really hard to use the expensive tools with the manual. But by the way, I've got this really shitty tool in the back. It's there. I don't like it. I don't want to use it, but it's there. And it's the reason why I say it's important to tell your partner this is because when you are triggered, it's important to know that your part to, that it's important for your partner to know that you might resort to that crappy tool and your partner should try to help you downregulate in those moments and come to some kind of homeostasis so that you don't use the tool and then continue working on that difficult to use tool. That's a fun metaphor, but it's, that's what it is. That's what it's like. Yeah. And I think I really like that a lot. I think underlying it is like the honest communication part, like to give a practical example. I don't know how much merit this holds because I'm one example, but I just get, I have this anger that's inside of me and like my dad has it and my brother has it. Both my brothers have it. Yeah. And I'm sure his dad probably had it. Yep. But I know that I'm like that. And I, my girlfriend knows that I'm like that. And so if she feels like I'm being unfair in that way, it's a very easy, okay, we're going to have some alone time. I'll see you we'll talk in a couple hours or whatever. Yeah. But that's maturity right there is to tell someone, Hey, I don't want to have these anger issues, but they're there and I'm working on it. And sometimes when I'm triggered, I do A, B, and C. And sharing your triggers with each other is important for any relationship. I um, joke that there's this other guy inside me that is very good at observing the way that I go about doing things in the world, how I like, it's almost your default setting is you can't control it. That's just how yeah. you're going to act and respond. And over time, our goal is to have that person inside us that observes that take over a little bit more, like steer the ship a little bit better. Um, and I think that I know you said just like becoming aware of it. Is there any other exercises or things that people can do that maybe will help them uncover some of those things other than just reflection? Oh yeah, for sure. So <laughs> there is a ton. <laughs> so I think it's important to try to integrate more effective communication into your daily life. Um, and you can do that by actively trying to be more assertive and less aggressive. Um, you know, aggressiveness demeans the other person. Assertiveness states your need or want without diminishing the other person's needs or wants. Uh, you can wear your heart on your sleeve, tell your emotions to the close people in your life, how they're making you feel, how um, things that, uh, you could talk about things that trigger you. So, you know, there's a lot of things that I didn't realize were triggers for me until my mid thirties. I'm 40 years old. So just in the last five years, I've had some moments where I'm like, oh, wow. So that's a trigger for me. And that word trigger is thrown around a lot these days. And, you know, people are like, oh, he put mayonnaise on my sandwich and I was triggered. It's like, dude, no, that is not a trigger. <laughs> a trigger is something <laughs> that throws you into that person that you're talking about that's inside that you have no control over. A trigger is something that is said or done around you that causes you to like go AWOL, that causes you to lose your mind and not, and not lose your mind, like kill someone. I mean, I'm not talking about that, that crazy, but a great example. So I've learned that people telling me what to do really triggers me. People, I feel what happens in my brain is somebody tells me to do something and in my brain I go, how did I go 40 years without um, without you in my life? You know, you've saved me. Thank you for telling me this. Like, I can handle myself. Don't tell me what to do. And I get, and that, and that's the nice version. In my head, sometimes there's a lot of yelling where I feel very, very angry. And I often will snap back and I will say, mean things. Like I'll, someone will say, um, Oh, Jenny, make sure that you do this. And I'll be like, shut the fuck up. What are you doing? And I'll say that to like my teenager, <laughs> you know, he'll be like, mom, can you do, or not Ken? Cause it's never Ken. If it's Ken, I would love it. Can you, that would be great. Um, but he'll say something like, 
uh, mom, don't drive that way. And I'll be like, shut the fuck up. What, who are you talking to telling me how to drive? I am 40. You are 14. I know how to drive. You do not. And then I, it keeps going and I get louder and louder and meaner and meaner. And then it's like, I can logically step back later. Once I've come down off the stress mountain, I've walked myself back down. I'm like, wow, that was such an overreaction to him telling me how to drive. He's 14. His brain makes him think he knows everything. He's just telling me what to do because that's part of growing up. I did the same thing. Um, and I overreacted and I like cussed at him and criticized him and told him he didn't know what he was talking about. Like, wow, what an overreaction. And so understanding your triggers is important. And just think about what happens anytime you get extra angry, anytime you get extra sad, anytime you get extra anxious, extra worried, right? Um, any of those things, what's happening in that moment? And it took a lot of me thinking about it where I was just like, oh, it's telling me what to do. It's somebody bossing me around because, you know, I don't need somebody to boss me around. I'm I'm a grown ass woman. I can do what I want. Uh, and and that triggers me. So thinking about your triggers, telling people your triggers, actively stopping yourself and having the moment of pause when that's happening. So uh, my son, my 14 year old, often will tell me what to do. He is the one that triggers me the most. Um, and he, he likes to be the boss. And he will tell me to check the mail almost every day. And I, that sounds so stupid when I say it out loud. My son tells me to check the mail and I cuss and yell at him. How dumb. That's ridiculous. Uh, but this is my human response to him. He'll say, mom, check the mail. And I'm like, you check the mail. You do it. I'm not checking the mail. Who do you think you are talking to me that way? And he's like, I just told you to check the mail. And I'm like, stop telling me to check the mail. So now um, he will say, check the mail, mom. And I'm like, why is this upsetting me so much? Like, let's take a deep breath. Let's take the pause. And sometimes I will just not respond to him at all. I will just take some deep breaths, try to ground myself in some way. So you can Google how to ground yourself. You can Google somatic exercises, things that can just help you physically ground. For me, it's like clenching my fists and then releasing, clenching them and feeling how tight I can make them for a few seconds, like really, really tight where it almost feels like I'm like white knuckling it and then slowly releasing and feeling that just release into my arms um, and taking deep breaths. Um, I think one of the main things we need to do is figure out our own unique, special down-regulating strategies. Because that's what this yeah. all really comes down to, is you're stressed out, you're triggered, you're overwhelmed, you're angered, you're sad, whatever. You're up on top of the stress mountain. When you're on top of the stress mountain, you can't hear anybody. People are like, calm down. And you're like, what? I can't hear you. Your brain cannot hear it. And so you have to figure out what you need to do to, to down-regulate. Google how to downregulate, how to regulate your nervous system. There's thousands of ideas, thousands. And some work for some people, some work for other people. Yeah. Something that I think is helpful for me. So as a fitness coach, I'll use this to as an analogy because this is what I know. Um, for example, say somebody wants to squat a really, really heavy weight and they've mm -hmm. never squatted before ever in their whole life. There's a lot there of like, there's a position that you have to learn. There's like the connective tissue in your body needs to adapt and learn how to do the movement. Your central nervous system needs to over time develop to take on heavy weight, a bunch of stuff. There's so many variables. And so it would be silly for us to expect that on the first day I can walk in and I'm just going to squat perfectly and then, okay, I just have to strength train and get stronger. Like that's not it, right? It's something that not only day one, you're not going to learn, but I've been saying this to new clients a lot. This is a very unpopular opinion, but just so you know, this is going to take years and years and years to get to where you are 
squatting super heavy, comfortably, and confidently. And it's not gonna it's not gonna suck until that point. Like it's just gonna slowly, ever so slightly, get a little bit better every time we work out. And then over time, it's gonna develop. And I think that knowing yourself, what you were talking about there, is the exact same thing. Just like, okay, I notice I got angry. Next time, hopefully, I'll notice I got angry a little bit faster mm -hmm. than the last time, and then. I'll try a coping strategy. Okay, that didn't work. Okay, let's try something else. Yeah. And I guess I would just, and you can talk about this too. What does the timeline of that look like? I'm imagining it's probably a lifelong thing of uh, ups and downs of you're getting better and then maybe some regressions even along the way. It is. And I, I think we also need to give ourselves some grace, right? So the way the brain works is in whenever we are dysregulated, um, it's difficult for us to think logically. It's difficult for us to like think like, oh, do that stress thing where you're, where you're holding your fists really tight or, or breathe. Like it's difficult when we're up there, when we're really overwhelmed and dysregulated, it's hard for us to think of what to do. And when we are born, we are physically incapable of down-regulating by ourselves. We're physically incapable of doing it in any way, shape, or form. The only way that a baby can down-regulate is with the help of a adult. And so your job as a parent is to help your baby down-regulate, and you do that through co-regulation. And so co-regulation is where I am going to be the calm for my infant. So my heart rate is going to be down. I am going to be breathing slowly. I am going to be rocking the baby in my arms while my body is rocking. I will be shifting weight on my feet to keep the movement going. I may be bouncing too, but I cannot be overwhelmed. Infants can feel that you are not downregulated yourself. Mm. And then it stunts their ability to downregulate. So the only way that we learn how to downregulate on our own, which by the way, our brain is not fully capable of complete self downregulation until the age of 26. I'm not there yet. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy, right? So our brain is not fully developed to the point where we can fully all the time downregulate by ourselves until the age of 26. So for 26 years, you as an infant, toddler, preschooler, elementary school, middle school, high school, college, you are a you need to learn to downregulate through co-regulation with another person. And so this is when it becomes being a parent becomes so, so important because the main person that your child is coming to for downregulation help is you. And so you have to, every time they come to you with some, I mean, and you can't do it every time because we're all human and kids get upset about the craziest things and they get upset about trivial things and they get upset frequently. So it's very difficult for an adult to be able to remain calm all the time. And so this is not an either or. It's not like if you mess up a handful of times a month, your child is ruined. No, that's not what it is. We Children just need thousands of repetitions from the age of birth to 26 of co-regulation to learn to downregulate on their own. Downregulation cannot be developed on your own. So it's not, um, so there are physical processes in human beings that you will learn on your own no matter what. So uh, no matter what, unless you have an illness that prevents you from doing it, a child will learn to swallow on their own and ingest food on their own. No matter what, a human being will learn to eventually sleep through the night. You don't need to train a human being to do that. No matter what, a human being will learn to use a toilet on their own at some point. It will. You will learn to do it. You will learn to recognize the signal in your body and go to the toilet. These are not things that need to be taught. You will not learn to downregulate 
on your own, no matter how old you get, if you don't have thousands of co-regulation examples in those first 26 years of life, thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And the older you get, the wider your, um, the, the more adults you can get that co-regulation from, right? In middle school, you could even get co-regulation from like an older kid, you know, like an 18 year old, 19 year old. When you're in high school, we often use our peers for co-regulation. When you're in college, you definitely use your peers and romantic partners for co-regulation. But the idea that a child will just eventually learn to downregulate on their own is not true. There are, and, and this is how you know grown ass adults who still do not know how to downregulate. They were not given those thousands of repetitions. I was given them by my mom and my dad. And I am still given those examples now. It doesn't mean that now I'm past 26, I'm 40 years old. It doesn't mean that for the past, you know, I don't know, dozen or so years that I haven't needed co-regulation. I use co-regulation all the time. Something happens to me, I call my best friend, we co-regulate together on the phone. Something happens to me, I go to my husband, we hug and embrace and we co-regulate together. I still need co-regulation, but I am also fully capable of down-regulating by myself. And if I didn't have those thousands of examples, I wouldn't be. And that's why we have so many adults who are not because they were not given those examples. So when you say, how long will it take? This is a 26 year process of us showing up for our kids over and over and over again and helping them learn to downregulate. And if, if we are parents who don't know how to downregulate, how are our kids going to know? If we can't do it ourselves, how are we going to help them? So it, it does become a vicious cycle. If yeah. And it's like a, yeah. like you said, it's lead by example, both with like dealing with emotions. This kind of feels like a pretty good bridge to romantic relationships too, where I see, you know, we, the example that we have as parents, for the most part, some people are co-parenting, but that might be one of the reasons why that's being normalized. It's like, we see the example from our parents. So like, okay, this is how, this is how this works for my, the longest time. My mom and dad would just like give each other a quick kiss before my dad left. And I'm in my head. I never knew that that is something that I'm sure a lot of people do it, but not everybody probably does that. I'm in my head. I'm like, oh, that's just how you. That's operate. how you say hello and how you say goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. But but little do you know that was intentional. That was purposeful. They chose that behavior and that helped their marriage. Yes, and um, I think that um, that is something that you know I don't even know what the divorce rate is at this point, but it's lower than it used to be. It's not fifty percent anymore. It's around the forties. It's in the forties. That's hopeful. That's good. Yeah. What do most people get wrong about romantic relationships? (laughs) Oh, what a big question. (laughs) What do most people get wrong? Um, I think most people get wrong that uh, their way is the way. So you grew up your whole life communicating with people a certain way. Uh, perceiving things a certain way, experiencing the world a certain way, talking a certain way, behaving a certain way. And then we get with another person and they are either mildly or drastically different from us. And we think that our way is the way. My way is not the way. It is a way. But it is not the way. And I think that that is actually what messes that and these unrealistic expectations that people have about what relationships are supposed to be, um, which is kind of what I'm talking about, that that really messes with people because they get with a, with a partner and they're like, oh, well, I engage in conflict this way. And this is the way that you should engage in conflict. This is the only way I've ever known. And then your partner engages in conflict a different way. And then you each want to change each other to do it the way that you do it. And you have to understand that everybody has a way and it's just a way. 
That's all it is. It's just a way. And we have to give each other more grace and more empathy and understanding each other. And, you know, we don't have to find somebody who fully understands us. We just have to find somebody who wants to fully understand us. And that is a lifelong process. It takes decades to, to understand someone. I think I know there's a lot to unpack with relationships of like how you respond to things that happen. But I think, and I would be interested to see where your mindset is on this. I know when I took your class, we talked a lot about the love languages. Um, is that like sort of the, I think that's just a very basic framework. Would you say of like how most people could understand how to do better at with their partner? Yeah. So the idea of love languages is that we all like want to receive love in a certain way. And we, and this is, goes back to what I was saying. Like we believe that the way that we receive love is the way. Um, and the way that we show love is the way it's the way to love. Um, and What's interesting is that the way that we show love to other people is often the way that we want other people to love us. And so if those languages are different, um, it could create some conflict, right? So um, Gary Chapman has five love languages. They are words of affirmation, physical touch. Uh, help me out here. What are they? Um, service, acts, acts of service. Gift giving. Gift giving and... Quality time. Quality time. That's it. Okay, so... I, I paid attention in your class. Good, good, good. So those cla those love languages, if you grow up your whole life loving other people the way that you want to be loved, and your love language is acts of service, which is mine, and, you grow, and, and your partner grows up loving other people the way they want to be loved, or the, yeah, the way... Uh, they want to be loved. And theirs is words of affirmation, which is my husband's. And we get together and one day we're in conflict. And in my head, I'm like, and he's he, like, let's say he says to me, I don't, I'm not feeling loved by you lately. I haven't been feeling loved by you lately. And in my head, I'm like, wait, I did the dishes. I made him lunch. I brought him breakfast in bed. I took the kids to the park. I, you know, helped him in the garage. Like, what is he talking about? I've been freaking amazing lately. What does he mean? And then what he really wanted was words of affirmation. And so instead of doing things for him, which is how I love other people, because it's how I want to be loved, he needed me to say how amazing he was, how much I value him, how much I appreciate him, compliment him. He needed me to give him those words of affirmation. And so in his eyes, it's like, no, you're not loving me because you're not giving me the things that I need. But in my head, I'm like, I don't understand. And early on in our relationship, I remember actually having a conflict. We had many conflicts about this idea. And I remember one time he was leaving for work and he was like, just so frustrated with me. And in my head, I'm thinking like, I do everything for this man. What is he, God, what is he complaining about? Like, he's really upset with me and it's so stupid. And I was mad and we, he, we parted ways. He went to work and I stayed at home and I was like, well, you know, I listen, listen to what he said. I'm like, I hear him. He needs me to say more words of affirmation. And then I still cleaned the house. And when he came home from work that day, wondered if that would be enough when we just had the conversation. And then when he didn't notice that the house was clean and he didn't notice that the chores were done and the laundry was folded, I got upset. And it was like, how is he not seeing all of this stuff I'm doing for him? Um, we've gotten past that now. We've been together for 23 years. We're, we're beyond the love language issue, but... Sometimes he'll say to me, like, I need more from you. And I'll be like, okay, like what? And he's like, don't, I don't need you to do the dishes. <laughs> and it's like a funny joke, you know, or I'll say to him, I need more from you. And he'll be, he'll say like, what? And I'm like, do the dishes. I don't want to ask you. I just need you to do the dishes. It makes me feel loved, please. And he's like, okay, okay. I need to pick up more around the house or I need to do something else, you know? Um, and so it's this idea that, we think our way is the way. 
And our way is just a way. And part of being in a mature love relationship is learning what our partner's way is, accepting it, loving them anyway, and, you know, moving through the conflict that will inevitably ensue because we have two different ways. I have thought about this for a while now. It seems as a society in general, we value some of those things more Mm -hmm. than we do others just naturally. And I'll give you an example. Like my girlfriend's love language is quality time. So if she says to me, hey, you haven't looked me in the eyes and had had a conversation with me about my day and like sat in the same presence and co-regulated together. Yeah. Like I, I'm like, okay, you got it. You're right. That makes total sense. But what if somebody's, and this is just like a, another example. What if somebody's um, love language is, I think physical touch and also um, gift giving are two that sometimes we look at and it's harder for us to accept that those things are the things that make people feel loved, especially if the physical touch is like on the sexual side of things for others, where it's like, it's very difficult for a person who values that to say to their partner, Hey, you know, we've, we've had sex one time in the last month, or Hey, when's, when's the last time you brought me flowers or wrote me a nice note? It's like, it seems kind of easier to look at that person saying those things and like, Oh, boo hoo, you know, you're going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that, um, I understand what you're saying and it is hard to say those that to, to like, I don't know, to say like, I need more gifts from you. And, (laughs) but you have to understand that the, if gift giving is your love language, it's not about the gift per se. It's usually the idea that your partner was thinking about you when you weren't with them. And so sending a text, telling them I'm thinking about you. Um, I saw this cute thing and it reminded me of you. Sending memes over social media, right? Sending each other videos. Those are kind, those are fulfilling a lot of the gift giving. And so I think when we, like, sure, gift giving gets a really bad rap, but uh, it's really what's underneath the gift giving. It's really about this idea that you were thinking about me when I was not there. And so I think if you phrase it that way, like, I need to know that you think about me throughout the day when I'm not around you, that is a different way to say, like, I need than saying I need, you know, more presents or more flowers. And this, the physical touch stuff, uh, you know, it really is just about physical touch. And so it, I mean, and I get it sometimes, especially when a man's top um, love language is physical touch, it often goes very sexual, but really it's just the idea. It's like touching them as you pass in the hallway, um, smacking their butt in the kitchen, right? Like, uh, getting a little grab in here and there (laughs) sitting next to each other in the couch. I have to tell you when, I don't know, it was probably like 10 years ago. I, um, we have like a, a couch with a chaise in our living room and I have four children. And so it's six of us. And when they, 10 years ago, they were small and, uh, we could all fit on the couch. It was fine. Like it was easy to fit four little kids and two adults on the couch. Well, when things got, when they got a little bit bigger, I was like, okay, we need more seating. Like I, we just need like one more seat. So I went and bought a recliner and my husband came home and there was a recliner in the living room and he was like, damn it. And I was like, what? He's like, why'd you buy that recliner? He was like mad. And I said, what is wrong? I bought a recliner. Like we need more seating. The kids are big. And he goes, you're going to sit in that recliner and you're not going to sit next to me on the couch anymore. And I was like, wow, like that really triggered a physical touch love language with him. Right. It triggered this need that he wants to sit next to me. He wants to hold my hand when we are walking outside. He wants to, um, you know, 
sit next to me on the couch. He wants to put his arm around me when we're standing with a group of friends, right? It's it. So it's not always sexual. It is often just this like closeness. And so I had to return the recliner <laughs> and I bought, <laughs> I bought a love seat instead. So now there's a two seater couch and the couch with the shade. So we got more seating and we both can sit on the two seater couch or we both can sit on the uh, chaise. And that might sound so silly, but it's, it's like a deep primal need. Like to him, he's like, why would we sit in the same room and not sit next to each other? And for me, physical touch is kind of low on my list. And I'm like, why does it matter? But it matters to him. And that's part of mature relationships is like, it doesn't matter to me either way. So why can't I do this small thing that matters very much to him? Yeah. And it's like, it seems two things. It's number one, think about your partner and what they do for you sometimes. It's out of their comfort zone yeah, or that and they don't care about at all. Right. And it's, it's like this, I, everybody hates this word, but relationships are mature. Relationships are really about serving one another. You know, and it's really about what can I do to serve you and what can you do to serve me? Because we both have different ways of doing life. Um, And so we need to respect each other's ways. We don't need to change each other's ways, but we need to respect them. Yeah. And that's like the hard work, right? Where it's like, I don't really feel like rubbing your head right now, but I know that it's important to you. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're important to me. So I'm going to do this small act for you. Cool. Um, this is a cool question. Uh, this is something that's kind of happened organically. The show is called good people. Um, we've asked everybody, this is episode, this will be episode four. So okay. not that many people, but <laughs> we've asked everybody what to them a good person is. I want you to take whatever twist you have on that. Initially, when I was going to ask you this question, I was going to say like, what is a good family member, tribe member, community member, partner, but it seems talking to you that you think of those as the same thing. So, I do. um, if you have like a definition or a couple points on what a good person is to wrap it up. Yeah. For me, a good person is someone who is capable of empathizing and accepting other people. That's it. Empathize with other people, accept other people, and and you are a good person. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? No. It's super... <laughs> Super short. That is literally it. I think that we all need more empathy. We all need more grace. We all need more acceptance of each other. Because if you tr- can truly empathize with someone, which is a very difficult thing to do, and you can accept them for exactly who they are, um, you you are a good person. But not many people can do that. It's very, very hard to do. Yeah, it's active in... Just like we were talking about earlier, it takes years and years and years of practice. And it's continuous over and over and over again. And especially when you're creating a life partnership with somebody, you have to accept and empathize with them in the beginning. Five years later, a new version of them. Five years later, a new version of them. Five years later, a new version of them. You know, we change who we are over and over and over again. And so you have to fall in love again and again and again and again and accept again and again and again and again. And that's hard. We have to do it with our kids too. My 14 year old is not the same person as he was when he was five. And I have to accept who he is for exactly who he is right now. Cool. I feel like I could talk to you for like three hours about this stuff, but, um, yes, we could. I could too. (laughs) Where can people find more from you if they're interested in checking out some of the work that you're involved with? Yeah. So um, I have a podcast called Love Matters um, with Dr. Jenny Rozier. I have one season of the podcast right now. It is uh, 14 episodes about the science of attachment. It's an educational podcast that is meant to be listened to from beginning to end. So all 14 episodes, you can pick and choose. You can jump around if you want, but Really, like if you really want to know what the science of attachment is, listen from beginning to end. Um, And so that's my podcast. I also am on Instagram at Relationships Love Happiness. Um, And you can Google my JMU faculty expert page 
uh, and see where I've been in the media and how to contact me if you would like to contact me for anything. <laughs> so yeah. Cool. I'll put all that stuff in the description of the video too. So everybody can just click links, make it easier. Alrighty. Well, thank you very much for doing this. This was super thank awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much.